going there. Yep, off we go. See, this is why I like getting the message out while you're out here and being able to pick up a newspaper or have a look at something that's in mainstream media. So what's happening out here doesn't have to be in a scientific journal. It has to be something that everybody gets excited about. Because if we don't, we're not going to have a planet to be excited about. So when you read about how everyone can participate in conservation and research to varying degrees, and you can see it happening out here, you can learn about it, understand it, become curious about the world again, just like we all did when we were kids. That's what I want to achieve out here. This is where Steve and I used to camp, is right here on Tombie Dam. And when Bindi was born, and she was very tiny, we would camp right up there on the dam wall. And this was just a beautiful place to kind of get away from everybody. And so Steve even entertained putting a house in here. So we'd just sort of be in the middle of nowhere. But when the wet comes, and it's a lot of heavy summer rains, the, the wall is breached and the water just pours through here. So we decided maybe not to build here. But we spent a lot of years camping here and watching all the wildlife come down to the water. There's water rats, giant freshwater turtles, all kinds of birds. It's just paradise. Mm -hmm. Um, is, has the world, is the world fast becoming uh, an Easter Island mm. where there are people mm. saying we've got to do something and, and is it happening fast enough to change as that we're... I think as we affect change on the planet and we look at issues like global warming, you know, we get to the point where we finally say, okay, there is global warming, but could it be our fault? Uh, it's challenging to ignore the reality that seven billion people and our consumptive nature isn't affecting the planet. So I think we need to do everything we can now and we need to be intelligent enough to realize that it will take a long time to affect positive change. That if we do that now, we can't be so impatient that in 10 years we say, look, see, we're changing the way we live and we're changing the way we run things and it's all the same. Well, it will be for a while, but if we don't start acting as countries, this island, which is Earth, is going to be in trouble and there's nowhere else we can go. So I think by being optimistic and everyone doing something, we'll be fine. If we sit back and say, the problem's too big, how can I cope? That's when we're in trouble. And something can be as small for, the average, for any person as, like you mentioned, snapping a T-bone. Mm. Yeah, that, that is true. The, the story of how large or small scale you want to affect change can be something as simple as the way you dispose of rubbish. And we discovered at our Australia Zoo Wildlife Hospital that we were getting lace goannas in that had tried to eat in a T-bone. And the sharp part of the T was poking through their neck. So they couldn't bring it up and they couldn't swallow it down. And what a horrific way to die. So of course these lizards were surgically repaired and were fine. But something as simple as snapping the ends off the T-bone before you dispose of it is important. And all the little things, turning lights off and recycling and riding your bike to work and the myriad of things, all help contribute to solving the problem. And I think ultimately, if we can look at the voluntary assistance of maintaining a steady population, that's the other great lie, is saying, we have to get more and more people to take care of the more and more people that we've got. And you look back historically, say in the 1950s and 60s, it was pretty usual for dad to work and the mother to be home and you've got this beautiful house. Now to have the same type of house, you've got to have a million dollar house and mom and dad working and trying desperately to cover all the costs. Things aren't actually better because we have more people. And I think it's critically important to look at that as part of a plan. And again, it's a pity this becomes such a political issue. It's time to start looking at common sense and just have a look around and deal with things in, in that method instead of getting all caught up in the bureaucracy and red tape. Life should start getting simple again. And I think we'll see that full circle. And hopefully all of our technology can work for us 
and make life better and easier instead of more polluted and complicated. Okay, great. Hmm. Back where you were again then, yeah. Skip from the top, shall I? No, just come, okay. come through in there and then we'll cut that. The Brigalow Belt is so important not only for conservation but also for agriculture. These trees make like big sump holes and the water comes in and they're like desalinators, nature's desalinators. And what's happened to the land around us, for the most part, it's been cleared. And the concept is, for agriculture, of course, you can't have any trees. And for livestock production, the less trees, the thought process is the more grass. Unfortunately, you'll see saline conditions creeping in within about five decades. So this land will protect our neighbors as well as the beautiful biodiversity here on this particular block. And that's what Steve and I fell in love with. It's so different. Every single area from gum trees to brigalow is just beautiful. And the changes you've seen just from 10 years ago, you, you say it's, it's like a healing effect coming yeah. out here. I think the changes we've seen on the land have been so special. When we first came, a lot of the areas had been overgrazed and really denuded. And now we're seeing it the way it probably was more than 100 years ago lots of kangaroos, lush vegetation, and it just makes you feel peaceful to come out here and see how everything's regrowing and looking so beautiful. This little piece of land is going to be something we can preserve and study in perpetuity. We'll pass it down to Bindi and Robert and their kids and maintain a little piece of Australia the way it was more than a hundred years ago. How can the average person help out? I think it's important for everyone to get involved and get excited about research again. We had that natural curiosity as kids, and that's what science is. It's just curiosity. You don't have to be an academic with a degree to appreciate what we've got around us. From backyards to having bat boxes, frog ponds, bird baths, right through to blocks of land where you might encourage people to be studying something special on the land. You can make a research project out of anything and help protect and preserve certain areas. So I really encourage people to get involved. And it seems like conservation properties that are on a larger scale are important for private people to hold as well. Mm. Now, it's five years on since Steve's gone. How do you think he'd feel now, seeing what's going here? I think five years on after losing Steve, it's a point of pride to have been able to not only maintain this beautiful property, but increase the work being done here. So over the last year, we've had Walma Python research. We've seen the regeneration of so much vegetation, an increase in macropod species, and yakka skinks, which are endangered. We've seen shinglebacks for the first time, and certain other species that have never been documented here. I think it'll just keep getting better and richer. And the easy part is, all you have to do is look after it. You don't have to do anything particularly special to make sure that it keeps healing and getting better. Mm. And how is it for the kids to come out there, Robert and Bindi? I think we're especially lucky to get to come here as a family because Bindi and Robert have so much fun exploring the property, riding bicycles, going camping, canoeing, paddle boarding, bringing their ponies out here. Robert's got his Pee Wee 50 and he can clock up about 35 k's a day just exploring. That's what's so nice. I think our managers with their family of seven kids really experience that getting kids free range is the way to go. It seems like we're getting battery kids locked into small areas. And Australia is so lucky because you really can go bush in so many beautiful, safe places. And for us, we, we don't take it for granted. This month, we're at, here, out here at this beautiful wildlife sanctuary. Next month, we'll be in Hollywood. So it's something that we really don't take for granted. And it's a big week coming up with the opening of Africa too. Yeah, we'll be out here enjoying the solitude, the peace, the quiet, and then it's the excitement back at Australia Zoo opening Africa. Steve's dream was to open a section of the zoo to really give people the visual effect of being in Africa, to experience giraffe and zebra and rhino all walking together in the savannas and also to be able to experience cheetahs walking through. So we'll, we'll bring that all together September 17th for the grand opening of Africa 
and it's going to be another one of Steve's dreams come true. I'm very proud. And emotional? I think it's a bit emotional as well. I think you're constantly going through that wishing that Steve was here to see and experience all of this. And it's something that none of us are immune to. We'll all experience grief in our lives. And instead of trying to overcome that grief, it's, it's important to honor Steve's legacy and to raise Bindi and Robert to be able to explore and experience their world the way they want to and to be able to bring Steve's dream to Australians and international visitors. Mm. So it's tough some days, it's tough most days, but I'm, I'm very happy to see these incredible things happening. Mm. And when you look at Robert too and, and Bindi, you see Steve on the motorbike. You, you, I heard that Steve used to row, uh, take the motorbike and the cheetahs would chase him on a piece of thing. And I just yes. look at that and think, oh, that looks like... <laughs> yeah, it's Bob. true. Yeah. It's, um, it's very special to see so much of Steve and Bindi and Robert. And I'm very fortunate to have kids who just happen to want to carry on with the work that we've been doing. Mm. And I think it's tough, even as little tiny kids, not to spend time with Steve and catch the bug, catch the conservation bug, that desire mm. to be closer to wildlife. And, and I watch them, I see Bindi tough on the outside and soft on the inside, just like Steve. And I see Robert climbing every tree and wanting to catch every lizard and experience everything to the fullest. And I'm very lucky to be able to give the kids that opportunity to be just like Steve. Yeah, and you can see they love it. It's not any condition or anything. This is just something they just love. Yeah, uh, it, it is awesome that they just love it. And it would be sad to take it away. Mm. Uh, so I think that whatever hard times we all have together this is our solitude this is where we can go to realize we're achieving steve's dream and it's so peaceful and beautiful out here and mm. we really encourage australians visit australia experience your own backyard you've always wanted to go but you'll say there's not enough time we don't have enough money the kids are in school grab them bring school with them and head for the bush you've got to do it or all of a sudden life passes you by Mm. Mm. And it's been a tough year for, for a lot of people with business and, you know, layoffs and things like that. But you're, you're hopeful that, that things will pick up on the, you know, global scale of everything and mm. yeah, by I've, building I've, the Africa and, and, and carrying it on. Yes, yeah. I've, I've noticed with tourism, all of us have had to tighten our belts. There's just not as much international visitation. We've had so many economic hard times. But the reality is, is that the economy will constantly rise and fall. Tourism constantly ebbs and flows. And while we're making sure to consolidate everything about our business, at the same time, it is kind of like breathing, where you breathe in and you breathe out. And with being careful now, we're also opening Africa. We're maintaining our more than 400,000 acres of conservation properties. We're continuing with research projects. Our Australia Zoo Wildlife Hospital continues to expand. And fortunately, with people in Australia and around the world supporting us and sponsoring programs that we're involved in, we can continue to expand the most important projects that we have both here in Australia and around the world. Mm. Are you hopeful um, animals like tigers will survive? They'll pull through when they, you know, become endangered in Sumatra and... Mm. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm eternally optimistic that when we see such precious species like tigers, like crocodiles, these animals that are top of the food chain, are magnificent forest elephants throughout Indonesia. We need to make sure to keep these animals around for generations to come. And when you protect the icon species, you're also protecting all of the wildlife and habitat that live with them. So it is genuinely critically important to protect these beautiful animals in beautiful places. And it's important for jobs, for tourism, and for the longevity of the planet. We've got to remember conservation is ultimately about us. Now here's a really tricky question. Mm. Do you think the future of conservation is too important to be left in the hands of politicians who make decisions on things? Or are, mm. are they just part of the process you have mm. to, to go through? I think there are a lot of conservation issues that are beyond politics. I think that when we are wielding our vote 
we can do so in a way to make sure that our natural resources are protected. Water, clean air, timber, minerals. You stop and think, we gather these things which are supposedly free to the tune of three trillion dollars worth every year. And the privileges of accessing all of these natural resources will come at a price if we don't look at sustainability. Along with these issues, we have the elephant in the room, which has to be population. In 1905, there were 1.5 billion on people on the planet. In 2005, there were 6.7 billion. As we approach 7 billion people on the planet, it's like throwing a party and having seven times as many people come as you expected. You won't have enough beds, you won't have enough food, you won't be able to accommodate them. And that's what the earth is looking at right now. So if people want to have a big family, that's a beautiful choice to have. But there are a lot of places in the world where I think assistance with family planning would help the overall use of these precious resources. And we need to start talking about these issues sooner than later because we don't want to lose clean drinking water, breathable air, and our brilliant natural resources that we kind of take for granted. Okay. Thanks mm -hmm. very much. No worries. Oh, lovely, dear. <laughs>